right. You ready to get started? Ready, ready. Good morning, y'all. Happy Monday. This is Mikhail, uh, and I'm here with uh, David Lormore from uh, Windy and Allison. David, good morning. Morning, Mikhail. How are you? I'm doing fantastic, man. Thanks for uh, joining me so early. Uh, for sure. So, honestly, did you have any trouble waking up this morning? Uh, I actually didn't because I had a uh, crazy, you know, we try to avoid these moments, but we had a uh, deploy that had to go straight to production uh, with, without <laughs> much testing. So I was doing that overnight, and uh, so I'm, I'm just awake from that. <laughs> you know, so I'm sorry you had to go through that, but funny you say that because, you know, Sunday nights is usually when I, like, it's my sixth day. And... Right. Often it extends into Monday, which is why, you know, it's the whole reason why Monday Morning Gasoline was born. My morning podcast that I was watching, um, a gentleman, a co-worker of mine, Adrian, uh, does this uh, containers and coffee, right? Yeah, and he used yeah. to do it every, you know, like four days a week. And then he quit doing it Monday. And so the one day a week that I'm always awake this early, uh, you know, the podcast was gone and I was just joking around. Oh, how about me and Taylor Swift videos? <laughs> and so we kept me and lost the Taylor Swift videos. I think I went the wrong way on this one, but you tell me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I imagine the the audience uh, demand for Taylor Swift is probably higher than Mikhail, although it's, it's probably pretty close. But <laughs> I don't know. Given my views, you're probably wrong on that one. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, uh, David, uh, you've been the CTO of Windy. Man, I remember, was that 2016 or 2017 when you guys first started this is very early in my trip back to Birmingham. Yeah, so um, we actually, our founder, Tommy and his wife, um, started Wendy or the ideas of Wendy back in the fall of 2016. And then uh, the, the app launched in um, the spring of 2017. And uh, then we, uh, they, they started ramping things up in, in the fall of 2017 is when I came on board to um, take over the tech side of things from a uh, great local consultancy in Birmingham there called Airship. You may or may not be familiar with them. I uh, am. But... I took a class from them. There you go. They're, they're good guys. Uh, they did a great job, and I think we're kind of fundamental to the early success there. Uh, but then I came on board, and we've been uh, running and gunning ever since. So I also noticed uh, when I was researching for our show that uh, so you have a second company that you're the CTO of, which looks like it uh, spun up from Wendy. Uh, can you tell me, a little, uh, Allison, right? Uh, can you tell yeah, me about yes. how, how you're running two different uh, <laughs> app startups right now? That, that's a great question. And after some of the struggles we've been through with COVID, it has been... Uh, been challenging, but we've, we've made it work. Um, fortunately, like I said, we, we started with a great tech foundation on Wendy. Um, so our, um, you know, sort of maintenance investments and whatnot to keep that running are pretty minimal. And so we can be very decisive about the features we have to do. Uh, but yeah, back in um, 2019, after a lot of feedback from our users that, hey, this Wendy tech is really cool. Um, could you do the same thing for, you know, nursing or um, elder care or, or substitute teachers or whatever? Um, we, we had lots of conversations with customers about things like that. Uh, we stumbled onto an opportunity um, with a local uh, temporary dental staffing service um, called Dental Re Referral Services. Um, and uh, it seemed like the right match to actually dive a little deeper and explore this idea of turning the windy experience and the windy technology platform into a more brand agnostic uh, uh, sort of industry um, agnostic white labelable type service uh, it made, made it uh, seem like this was the right opportunity to pursue that. So. So wait, what? So what is the Wendy? So yeah, some of our viewers maybe have not heard of uh, Allison or the Wendy platform. So, so so let's start with what is I guess Wendy to begin with. What does Wendy allow, and what is the framework underneath it? Yeah, that's that's great. So um, Wendy 
uh, the, the kind of one-liner here is Wendy makes it easy for parents to find book and pay uh, background checked, vetted college student babysitters um, in a very on-demand fashion. So the, the, the feedback we usually get when we tell people that is like, oh, it's the Uber for babysitting or the Lyft for babysitting. And that's like kind of what we're going for. Um, there's still some, uh, some of the challenges of um, supply and demand in this type of marketplace that, that uh, keep COVID kind of killed, man. I mean, like talk about like a, a factor that you really can't control. Like, yeah. holy crap. Yeah. So uh, it, that, it's challenging, but we've done it to where, you know, in Birmingham right now, um, your first, if you post a babysitting job in Birmingham right now, you'll on average have a babysitter express interest within five seconds. Holy the crap. The average time That's to awesome. actually book a babysitter is three minutes. <laughs> So I see you guys are though in like all of the Southeast, right? So that's pretty good. Um, man, you yeah, haven't made yeah. it to Texas. You, you know, I have to say, I've been waiting since you moved back to Dallas. I've been like, all right, is this thing coming? When are we going to get this? Yeah, but, yeah. Now that I'm in Dallas, uh, you know, we definitely want that. Want to uh, go west and uh, hit hit the big three here in Texas. You know, Dallas, Austin, and Houston. Um, don't forget the, our friends in San Antonio, man. They, uh, yeah, yeah, those guys too. Uh, you know, they're they they have a special place in my heart because of some of the uh, the stuff I went through with the army. Uh, may not may not be in the best way. But. <laughs> yeah, you uh, you you were stationed in San Antonio, weren't you, for a while? Or? Uh, yeah, so I was actually in the reserves, but my second deployment, I deployed out of San Antonio, and so I spent about four months in the summer of two thousand eight. Uh, living out of a red roof in in San Antonio, getting ready to <laughs> to deploy to oh, Kuwait, man. and uh, there are better things you could do with your summer than live out of a red roof in. I can tell you that much. I can. I have had a bad experience at red roof myself. Uh, you know, we probably shouldn't. Let's not talk <laughs> about sorry, it. I, don't, I don't mean to knock any but, brand, but when but... when. You, <laughs> when you're trying to survive, you don't even have a microwave to like <laughs> cook food. If you didn't make it to the uh, on base cafeteria, it's uh, it's not a fun way fun way to live. <laughs> well, uh, let's go back talking about the framework. So, so Wendy yeah. ran into some, you know, obviously babysitting trouble because people are staying at home to fight COVID, and you know that. Uh, and by the way, thank you for your service, man. My bad, but uh, <laughs> no problem. So, so what you know? So, what did you do? Uh, after, you know, after yeah, you guys so, were presented with that. So, yeah, so we, you know, stumbled onto this uh, Allison opportunity uh, or dental referral services opportunity. By the way, the, the Allison name comes from sort of an homage to um, the founder of that service, Allison Springer. Um, the Wendy name, by the way, comes from an homage to um, uh, Wendy Darling from the Peter Pan, and she was sort of the mother of the Lost Boys, and so uh, definitely uh, have a uh, sentiment towards uh, you know naming naming these things after prominent uh, female figures. Um, so, anyways, we uh, we dove into um, this uh, new sort of dental opportunity feet first, um, but because of that feedback we had received prior. Um, to diving in, you know, we, we knew we wanted to build this new service in a more industry agnostic fashion. And so um, as we started sort of building this version two, we've been thinking about that all the long way and, and thinking through what are those primitives that we need to create that go beyond the specifics of, I need a babysitter or I need a you know, dental hygienist, I need somebody with a college degree, whatever, what are the things that we can pull together that make all of these experiences similar? What are the things that you do um, to, to find the right talent for a, you know, a short term, uh, I hate to call it gig, because these are what we're mainly focused on is really more sort of skilled vetted talent versus just, you know, I need somebody to get me from uh, my house to the bar without crashing, like the, the barrier to entry is pretty low there versus, you know, somebody that's going to take care of your own flesh and blood or somebody that's going to be digging around with sharp instruments in your mouth. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I think you're, 
what you discovered, I think, was uh, was something that yeah, I think is crucial is that that same application that you build, if you design it the right way, which I guess you and uh, Airship did, uh, because you're able to take that core code because you know whether you are a skilled dentist hygienist or a babysitter the reality is if you're booking for gigging it's the same right you're mm -hmm. you have to have some kind of verification process you have to have you know a way for the two to communicate and to be able to set time and dates and you know so with there are obviously customizations and you know things but in the end it's you know if you were able to code it originally to not hard code everything you know then you know you guys were able to not pivot but take that and now you can stamp out new gig economy sites you know i mean i'm not gonna say it's easy because we both know <laughs> development yeah. it's never easy but uh that, that's really awesome so uh should they go if people are interested in their own gig economy site they should go to wendy and reach out to you guys or um, yeah, if they want to reach out to uh, Wendy or actually like right now, we're still in the very early stages of exploring what those next industries might be. If people want to find me on LinkedIn, that's probably the easiest way to connect with David me. David Lormore? Conversation. Yep, David Lormore on LinkedIn. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one. <laughs> very cool. Um, so usually this is the part where we talk about uh, some news that's interesting to both of us. And you brought us a very cool article um, about NVIDIA. So I want to talk about this one first. And right now, you know, NVIDIA is making bank. And so is mm -hmm. AMD through, you know, AMD is doing it for two reasons. But um, meanwhile, you know, Tesla had to shut down one of its plants for a day or two because uh, they can't get all the chips they want, uh, you know, uh, tariffs aside, you know, companies are having a hard time uh, getting going. Um, yeah, yeah, it's been <clears throat> crazy. I've, I've been following this from the GPU angle because I recently got back into sort of custom PC building and, and a little bit of gaming and whatnot. My kids are at that age where they're getting into, you know, Fortnite and stuff like that. Is so. it your kids, really? Or is it because you want to play games? It's a great excuse, man. It's hey, all for the kids. I can't even do that. Uh, I was playing Val Valheim. Uh, yeah, Valheim. yeah, I've seen that. So. Nice. Uh, but yeah, it's, I, so I got into it from that angle and, um, you know, was was holding out building something because, you know, NVIDIA had the, the 2080s, which are a great graphics car. They were a huge leap forward, but they were so expensive. So it's holding out for like the, the new like 3000 series and, and also for what AMD had in store because they've been making some awesome improvements in the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, everything released starting in last fall and it was like, it, it was, it, it all came out and, but the, you couldn't buy anything. And it was like, what is going on? And I'm still sitting here you know, five or six months later, like, when am I going to be able to buy a graphics card? Because I've got this, you know, it's a, it's a decent little, I think it's like an RX 590 maybe, nice. um, which is getting the job done for most of the games right now. But like, I, have I was a ready to... I uh, 285 right now. Okay, nice. Yeah, so I, I, uh, I've been like holding out, waiting, and nothing's... Uh, nothing's come out and uh like you were saying too i i was listening to uh or watching a youtube video the other day that was talking about the fact that um like you said a big factor in the gpu shortages is the fact that every single uh auto manufacturer needs this silicone for uh for ecus and stuff like that too and they're a higher priority in the government's eyes so when when all the tariffs come into play and everything like the the, the cars are going to get it before the the gaming rigs and the um you know so you you uh, think it's fun is stuff <laughs> so you know this kind of correlated with you know the spike in bitcoin right and uh -huh. i find that Nothing. like about was it last year that they they someone did the math and said that you know it's no longer efficient at the price to mine bitcoin and then the price went up and now <laughs> and now it's efficient again because yep, right, yep. the the amount of money you make per per bitcoin has just gone up so i wonder if that has contributed you know to the shortage because i remember for a few years like 2017 2018 it was really hard to get a gpu and then 
when the Bitcoin price kind of lulled after it hit the 20K first, you know, it it seemed like it died down. And actually, so I think I misspoke. I said a 285. I think it was a 585 actually. It was two year, two year brand new card, uh, 585 GTS. I bought it from a, uh, from an online classifieds for our neighborhood mm -hmm. that this dude uh, was selling because he was a miner and you know he's upgraded to the 5000 there was a brief moment where the 5000s were really well in stock for AMD yeah. and so i guess he upgraded then and uh, i got this car this beautiful $200 card for like 100 bucks and there you go all right <laughs> sure i'm not going to mine but i'll play some yeah. games all right yeah, so people always people always hate on the uh the pre built from Best Buy and, and whatnot, but I've gotten both of my, I've got like a gaming laptop that my kids use and share, and I've got my own like PC in here, and uh, both of them are pre built. And the reason I got them is because I could, like, the graphics card in it was more than half of the cost of the entire thing. So, like, getting that as a full package is way cheaper than anything I could have built, even if it's not, you know, the, the, greatest components or whatever it's like it gets the job done and i've got a graphics card that i can you know move along with the system as i change out some of the other components and make the rest of the system work better yeah i always have like a several step process like one thing gets upgraded at a time you know motherboard and cpu memory sometimes you can't do that because you know you switch from ddr3 to ddr4 but you know mm -hmm. i tried it so my system's various incarnations of you know whatever i was buying at the time but uh, yeah. So, so, on to the next story that uh, we were going to cover. Uh, I don't have the browser up, but uh, we're going to talk about Starlink. Um, yeah. So and Tesla in general, but uh, they did just miss. Uh, they didn't launch their satellites this weekend. I think they uh, they delayed an hour before launch. But did they uh, uh, miss out on that? <laughs> but I mean, in general, there are enough satellites up there, and for those who have been under a rock and don't know what Starlink is, right? It's Elon Musk's uh, satellite internet service that's supposed to give sub to 20 millisecond ping, ping times. And if you're a gamer or if you're doing something low latency like streaming it, or like, you know, live cast, it's super important to have low latency. And what I would say about 35 milliseconds is, or, you know, is good for game. It, anything under 35 is pretty okay for like first person shooter and rapid uh, rapid movement and mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah trying to keep it within that like that clip of 60 frames per second I think is is ideal there if you're if your ping can keep up with your your frame rates you're in good shape <laughs> so Starlink apparently is there right and they're they're getting like uh, sub 20 millisecond pings and you know the download speeds about 200 me uh, megs right now but the you know Elon a year or so ago promised up to a thousand to one gig. I don't know if that's possible, um, you know, but you know, two hundred is already better than what I can get from AT and T uh, when I move back to Birmingham. So uh, I pre-ordered. Um, <laughs> nice. And yeah, so I guess I'm gonna go Starlink. The cool part is anywhere in the U.S. I move, uh, you know, after it's available, I'll be covered, so I don't have to switch, you know, and and they don't, you know. Tesla doesn't seem to be playing games. I'm sorry, SpaceX doesn't seem to be playing games with their pricing either. You know, it's yeah. like, this is going to be the fee. Here's the equipment. You pay for it. But not like with AT&T, where for a year, I can get the thing at like $40, and then it jumps up to $80 for, yeah. you know. Yeah, as as uh, as a self-proclaimed uh, <laughs> big, big fan of Elon, uh, you know, I, I think this is just another sort of, you know, one of many genius moves that he's made because uh, you know there's there's the the gaming issue but there's so many other like factors that make this such a like because he's got the tech to do it with space and spacex and everything else um so many factors that make this make sense you know in in most areas everywhere i've lived it's basically been a monopoly there's supposedly competition when it comes to internet services but in birmingham most places you have a choice of either AT&T or Spectrum, um, or if you're lucky, maybe you get to pick between the two, but like you're kind of at the behest of whoever like put the wires in the ground, so to speak. And, uh, and then even beyond that, the fact that, um, you know, there's so much of our country, even as like, you know, the, the world superpower, there's so much of our country 
that has uh, either really bad or no internet service whatsoever. So like this, this, you know, gives folks in rural Kansas or wherever the opportunity to be just as connected as somebody living in San Francisco or New York City. And I think that's going to liberate a ton in terms of um, kind of tech workers as well as tech products and just, you know, just another like I said, genius move from uh, from good old Papa Elon there. <laughs> so I have, you know, I have a theory about everything the man does. And I think it's all about developing the technologies that are required for us to live on Mars. Global communications, uh, subservice, uh, you know, places to live and transport. Travel, I think, yeah, yeah, the yeah. boring company, the whole point of that was so test the technologies here so they can be you know, used on Mars, Tesla, I yep. mean, the Cybertruck, well, I think was, uh, like the reveal of his hand. Like it's the, it's, 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 if yeah, it's not, yeah. uh, the drop, then it's at least the river, you know? Yeah. It's, well, it's all solar power and batteries too. So you don't need to, it's probably the most efficient way to get power on Mars, uh, at least as of right now. So, so, so uh, set up a nuclear reactor. <laughs> well, yeah. So funny enough, uh, uh, boring companies working on a, me uh, an electric boring machine. And the only place that that like makes sense is if you have wires coming from like a nuclear reactor or something like that. And yeah. so like, just like seeing the grander vision behind it, he's testing and, you know, validating all these technologies that he thinks are going to be required on Mars. So I think Starlink, you know, boring company, uh, Oh man, I should have brought this article up. Uh, some executive in the uh, the sub t the tunneling industry, you know, was like, "Oh yeah, I don't think much about Elon. He came in and out of the meeting. He didn't pay much attention to us, or something like." Uh, I read this yeah last night. It's a great story, but basically they dismissed him. But so did the Russians when he, you know try to buy a ballistic missile, you know, so yeah, did the car yeah. companies when he built Tesla, you know, and nobody thought Solar City would survive. And I mean, it really didn't, right? It as yeah. its own thing, but Tes through Tesla, it had a second life. Right? So yeah, I think yeah, I'm, I'm still, uh, still saving up for the, uh, the solar roof thing. Like, I, I think that's another, I mean, everything, everything about it is all genius. And like, like, I love what you said, how it's all like playing into this, grander plan of like uh, you know uh i think in a lot of ways you know you look at walt disney was sort of like had this whole idea of the land of tomorrow but it was all kind of like make-believe and then elon is like the one actually like making the land of tomorrow <laughs> yeah i think that's a good a good way to look at it you know it, so uh you know not to switch the subject well to switch the subject because uh <laughs> to keep the time going um yep you're hiring um i wanted to mention that because uh these are some interesting positions um the head of engineering and head of marketing can you tell us a little bit so for people who are maybe interested what type of people you're looking for yeah so in addition to that we're we're hiring for several engineering positions and and some other things as well but those two key hires or those two hires are pretty critical to uh getting things uh moving forward from here um, so the head of engineering looking for somebody that can come in and be very sort of hands-on in the short term, uh, our stack is primarily, uh, Ruby on rails, Heroku, uh, Postgres, and on the front end react for the web and react native. Um, so we're, we're pretty focused on our, uh, core technology competencies there. So really looking for somebody that knows those those technologies inside and out and can come in, like I said, be hands on, but also um, help us sort of regrow the team. Uh, we're looking to hire um, about four to six engineers in the next couple of months as well. Um, so somebody that can can make an impact individually, but also, you know, help build out and manage that team. And hopefully from there in the next you know year or two, that team will be growing significantly uh, once the, the other person, our head of marketing, helps us grow the actual uh, business, um, really looking for somebody that's focused on customer acquisition um, and is very sort of, uh, you know, tech savvy is a real generic term, but somebody that's focused on data, knows how to run a, um, an effective analytics program, 
and sort of track their results across both digital channels and, um, uh, you know, physical media, like posters, flyers, I hate to say billboards because probably won't do that in the short term, but a lot of kind of boots on the ground yeah. campaigns in addition to the digital side. So, um, somebody that knows how to run those things and, um, can, can deliver results and also sort of understand the results so that we know which, which areas we, we should be doubling down on and which ones we should be canceling and things like that. Sweet. So if you guys are looking, uh, reach out to David Lillimore. LinkedIn's probably the best place, right? Or through Wendy? Yep. Um, you can also go to careers.wendy.com for those postings. And like I said, there will be some other ones in the future as well if folks want to take a look there. Sweet. And by the way, I think you guys are going to do amazing in 2021 because as soon as this pandemic, as soon as we can get a vaccine and leave our kids somewhere, you know we will. Like, oh, as yeah. parents, <laughs> you, there's we're, so we're much already... pent-up demand that, like, as soon as people are like, oh, yep, you can leave your kid with a random stranger again. Yes! Yeah, Sorry. yeah. Uh, we're, we're already seeing the, the early signs of that. Our numbers have been kind of creeping upwards and uh, definitely we're, we haven't done any proactive marketing since uh, since the fall when we we're doing some more kind of like COVID support related stuff, but we haven't done anything in the new year and numbers are up and to the right. <laughs> well, good, man. I'm, uh, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad it's, you know, things are getting back slowly, Thanks, but man. surely. Uh, so exactly. we only have uh, four minutes left, but I want to cover two things real quick. One is I want to get a book from you that you recommend to our viewers that, you know, for motivation. But uh, so you had me take a hiring test as if I were a, a coming employee. And I thought this was really cool. And so I did end up having this up. So this is Mikhail uh, uh Windy application or Windy, I guess, personality test. Is that? Yeah. yeah, it's called the culture index. It's more than a personality test. It's really sort of a fit assessment and sort of behavioral traits assessment. One to help you understand, you know, where you might fit as a person, as well as, you know, within our team, if you were to get hired. Um, and it's really like all about the those dot graphs up at the top. Uh, I don't think we'll have time to dive into how those, no, we won't. those work, but you and I talked about this a bit and, uh, um, I love your title. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of crazy. The, uh, make it rain from a long game volley. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's it's super insightful, and we've been using that um, on the re recommendation of several several other companies um, as a as a means to sort of level up our hiring process, and um, especially for some of these key roles I mentioned finding the right fit, we're really taking our time to make sure we can get the best possible people in those seats versus, you know, just trying to rush and get get a, a warm body in there, so to speak. So, I mean, as a startup, it's got to be hard. And so you have two minutes left to spend however you want, but how do you, like, uh, so take as much of that time as you want to tell me how you do that, uh, you know, with the limited amount of time that you have? Sure, I'll I'll, uh, I'll tie it into my book uh, references. I've got <laughs> I've got two here that uh, I've been reading simultaneously on the recommendation of several friends. Uh, one is called uh, Traction, which is um, uh, a book that essentially lays out this thing called the entrepreneurial operating system um, that gives you sort of a framework for the key things you should be focusing on to run and grow your business and sort of gives you sort of a, you know, like I said framework to understand or like plot out how you should be organizing your leadership team and how you should be uh, running meetings and things like that. And gets into the nuts and bolts of, of running an early stage business. So we're, we're implementing that to, to provide some additional structure beyond the, you know, goals and objectives and things we've had in the past. And then specifically around the hiring, I've been reading this book, Who, um, once again, on the recommendation of several friends, um, that gets into the nitty gritty of like how to run a very sort of organized, uh, effective hiring process. And, uh, you know, we're taking it and sort of tweaking it to our own needs. But that, uh, that culture index survey is, is one part of that. Um, getting, getting the whole picture of a candidate versus you know, what 
Um, what I think most companies do is, is, you know, rely heavily on their gut intuition and they're just like, this guy seems like a nice guy and, or, you know, or gal. Um, and you, you like latch on to one or two traits, whether it's a skill or dude's really good at golf or he likes to barbecue. I keep saying he could definitely be a she as well. Um, but like you latch on to one or two traits and then like all the un- other information doesn't matter. And so this, this who book lays out like how, how to like overcome your personal biases and the team biases um, to one, define the role that you're hiring for effectively. And then to find a quote unquote, a player for that role. Excellent. And it's good to have friends like that. And speaking of friends, thank you uh, for coming on and uh, waking up or staying up early with me and uh, <laughs> doing you know pretty early edition of my podcast, man. I, I really appreciate it, David. Hope you have yeah, an man, amazing this is, week. This is fun. Always, always good to catch up with, with old friends and uh, wish you the best uh, with the podcast. And the, how, how much longer until you move to Birmingham? Uh, May 29th, we leave here. So I'll be, by June 1st, I will be in Birmingham back home. And uh, yeah, we'll be rocking and rolling. And um, we'll be you know putting together a DevOps days for next year, you know, once everyone is post-quarantine and um yeah i can't wait for you to visit and uh see how how everything's going man yeah man we'll definitely be there we'll definitely be there for the conference for sure and uh look forward to all of it all right but much love have an awesome week and uh yeah we're we're out all right talk to you later see you buddy. all right um we may or may not be broadcasting our audio right now so let me cut off the stream and catch up with you for a second